Last week was rough. I'm sure some of you took the time to watch my breakdown on whatever it is that the Falcons are attempting to do this season, and most of you that saw that likely felt the same sense of disgust that I did when I made it in the first place. And in times like this, when I almost need to rinse my mind of something terrible, I often turn to the NFL's ultimate palate cleanser for film nerds like myself, Mike Zimmer's defense. When all hope is seemingly lost, and when it looks like defensive head coaches are becoming a relic of the past, I can always count on those guys up in Minnesota to remind me what an aggressive, well-coached team is supposed to look like. Harrison Smith, Eric Kendricks, Daniil Hunter, Everson Griffin, Anthony Barr, Xavier Rhodes, I mean the names go on and on. You know them well because they've all been doing their thing for a long time together up north, and I think what fascinates me the most about this unit is that because they've all played together for so long, this defense is really more than the sum of its parts. They all communicate so well, and they understand each other's responsibilities at such tremendous depth that they can process offenses very quickly, and they can correct their mental errors faster than most other younger, less experienced units. Take this series of play against the Eagles from last week as an example. This is in the first quarter on third and three, and Philly is running that tried and true shield screen to Alshon Jeffrey that they run all the time in short yardage situations. You can go back and watch my episode from last January on this exact same play design, and how the Eagles, Saints, and Patriots all use it with a huge rate of success down in the red zone. And the thing to note here is how passively the Vikings secondary and linebackers are playing this screen. I don't think they expected it to be run in this area of the field, so they kind of got caught off guard a bit, and they aren't attacking the ball or the blocks in front of them. And as a result, Jeffrey is able to surge forward almost uncontested and get the first down to extend the drive and eventually get some points. After that play though, now knowing that Peterson would look to maybe dial it up again on another short yarded situation, the Vikings adjusted and pretty much any time the Eagles gave them a stack or a bunch formation to one side or even anything else that even looked like a screen could be run out of it, they attacked the receivers relentlessly and never let them get a clean release in their routes or clean blocks at the point of attack. We saw that here in the third quarter on another third and short opportunity, when it was still only a seven point game, mind you, and you can literally see Anthony Harris running up to his corner shouting screen, 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 while giving their hand signal for screen, and you can also see Eric Kendricks darting his eyes back and forth into that bunch, just daring Wentz to try that throw again. Naturally, he did, and Minnesota rallied to the ball immediately and overwhelmed both of Jeffrey's blockers at the point of attack, eventually bringing him down for a loss. That forced the Eagles to take a field goal rather than potentially getting another touchdown to tie the game, and that ended up being a big factor in keeping this game from falling apart late for the Vikings. If there is one consistent theme that you see from this Minnesota defense week after week, it's that you might get them on a certain play call once, but you sure as hell won't get them on it twice. They learn from their mistakes and they adjust to them so quickly that in order to have any sustained success against them, you basically have to keep feeding them new looks on every single series. If you don't keep them off balance by constantly showing them something that they haven't seen before, then they will eat you alive. Another aspect of Zimmer's defense that I've always found to be underappreciated is how his blitzes are designed and how their personnel are coached to execute them. There was a play against the Giants a couple weeks back that was basically teaching tape for every single defensive coach on how a stunt should be executed. It's third and seven from the Giants 43 yard line and the Vikings are in a front known as 05 solid. You've got the nose tackle in a zero technique and the other defensive tackle in a five eye technique way outside the left guard. So there's the 05 part of that. And the solid comes from Anthony Barr, the Sam linebacker, being also on the line of scrimmage in a two point stance out in a seven technique alignment. Now, the blitz that they're running is called Green Weak Sikkim, meaning the Will linebacker, or weak side linebacker, Eric Kendricks, will be doing a green dog blitz. That's when he's on the running back in a coverage responsibility until the running back shows he's in protection, and then he gets the so-called green light to then blitz himself, while the Sam linebacker, Anthony Barr, is on a blitz called Sikkim, which just means the Sam is coming in on a pressure. So again, 05 solid green weak Sikkim is the call for the front and for the pressure. And the thing to watch here is how Daniil Hunter and Anthony Barr execute this pressure, because this is the kind of stuff that you really only see from defenses that have played together for a long time. Barr and Hunter are on their fifth season together in this system, so they know how everyone is gonna rush, they know how the coverage is structured and how much time they have to get home, and they know the angles that they need to take to get the job done. So as Barr is passing Hunter to get lined up, Daniil just leans back and basically tells him, hey, I got you, rush off my inside hip and you'll be free. 
And that's why this is interesting, it's because most Sikkim Blitzes do not incorporate stunts because that's just a recipe for giving a quarterback a lane of escape out to the edge. But both Hunter and Barr know that from an 0-5 front, Everson Griffin is going to be lined up really wide, which means he's going to be taking a really wide arc to the quarterback. So they can afford to ditch contain on their side because even if Jones does roll out to his right, Griffin will be running at full speed from behind him to track him down anyway. And again, these are just the little things that come from all of these guys playing together for half a decade. They know how each other are going to rush from each position so that they can maximize each other's effectiveness. Anthony Barr, of course, came free on that stunt, just as Hunter thought he would, and Griffin had a great angle around the back of the pocket for cleanup duty, so Daniel Jones went down easily before he could get the ball out. This was as heads up a call as it gets by Hunter to tell Barr to loop inside, but I also want you to pay attention to the technique Hunter used to free up Barr in the first place because what he did after the snap was just as important as the call he made before the snap. As Hunter crashed that B-gap to draw the attention of both the guard and the tackle for the stunt, look at this rip move he puts on right guard Kevin Zeitler. It looks like a normal rip that any pass rusher would be using to try to win around the edge, but what he's actually doing is getting a hand up under Zeitler's armpit so that he can hold him in place and prevent him from reacting to Barr's stunt. It's an extremely crafty and also technically illegal move, but highly effective and 99% of the time it's not going to be flagged because it's very, very subtle. This is a perfect example of how unselfish this entire Vikings front seven is and how they all work together to create sacks for the team just as much as they try to create sacks for themselves. Whether it's holding offensive linemen to make better angles for their blitzers or perfectly layering their rush angles to keep quarterbacks from escaping, these guys are some of the most well-coached pass rushers in the entire league and I cannot get enough of them on tape. And speaking of layering rushes, by the way, that may be one of the most critically underrated coaching points of all Zimmer defenses year after year. And it's a big factor in why the Vikings pass rush always seems to be good no matter who's on the field. When a defensive line is rushing the passer, you don't really want all four guys to end up in the exact same spot or in the exact same level of the pocket, especially against mobile quarterbacks that can move and escape and make things happen on the run. What you do want, though, is for each individual rusher to be on a different vertical level of the pocket so that the quarterback will always have a body in his face no matter if he steps up or if he steps back and rolls out. You always want someone there to meet him and selling out to get to a particular level, and if you can get all four defensive linemen on the same page about who is going where, it completely shuts down all lanes of escape and there's nothing a quarterback or an offensive line can do about it. Take this sack on Aaron Rodgers from week two, for instance. Every single defensive lineman in this four-man rush has a specific role to do, and they all work in concert with one another. Daniil Hunter is working wide around the edge so that he can chase Rodgers down from behind if he decides to roll out left to buy time. Griffin is working the inside shoulder of David Bakhtiari so that he can collapse the pocket inside and bait Rodgers into rolling out behind him directly into Hunter's pursuit angle. Linval Joseph is bull rushing straight into Billy Turner, again to compress that pocket, and so that he can keep watch over this B-gap lane of escape. And Jaleel Johnson, he's keeping outside leverage on the left guard, Lane Taylor, so that, again, if Rodgers tries to roll back out around to the left, he can just easily disengage and put him into the grass. There's a lot of layers to this rush. Everybody has a level responsibility, and that's why it works. By the time Rodgers decides to get out and extend the plate, there's nowhere to go. Billy Turner is shoved straight back into his face, he trips over his foot trying to get out the front door in the B-gap, and Joseph easily disengages to get the sack for an 8-yard loss. This was perfect execution, and hell, even if Rodgers didn't trip, he still probably would have not gotten very far anyway because, again, the rush was layered well, and Griffin was already starting to make a beeline for that lane of escape anyway. There was literally nothing he could do to get away here. If you're wondering why Aaron Rodgers has taken more total sacks and more sacks per game against Minnesota than almost any other team, this is it. Since Mike Zimmer took over in 2014, the Vikings have sacked Rodgers more than three times per game, which is substantially higher than his career sack rate of only two and a half. Hell, even going back to Zimmer's days with the Bengals, Rodgers took five sacks per game in those two matchups, which is even higher still. So I would argue that in terms of coaching up pass rushers to handle mobile, very slippery quarterbacks, there's nobody in the NFL that's been better than Mike Zimmer. I know that it's a tired cliche to say that football is a thinking man's ideal form of violence and a violent man's ideal way of thinking, 
But when it comes to the Minnesota Vikings, it's absolutely true. Over the past six years, with all of these ultra-talented players sticking together and almost growing up within the same system, it's never been their physicality that made this defense work. It's been their ability to think, to outsmart offenses both before the snap and after it. Do they get lit up from time to time when they see something new or when a coach takes advantage of the few weaknesses they do have? Sure. Do they have the best secondary or the best linebackers or the best D-line? Probably not. But while they may no longer be the best defense in the NFL, I love watching the Vikings because they're the most entertaining defense in the NFL. They play mind games, they take risks, and they're unapologetically themselves in every single game. As I watched all of their tape from this season to remind myself what an actual good team looked like, I kept repeating the same sentence over and over inside my head, and it's a thought that I've held for many years now. When you play against this Zimmer defense, it's not a question of whether or not you can score on them, it's a question of whether or not you can survive long enough to score on them. For most quarterbacks, they can't survive long enough to throw, and when they're laying in the grass, looking up at four purple jerseys and trying to figure out what the hell just happened, the answer is almost always the same. It wasn't just a violent man that drove him into the ground, it was a thinking man too. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this week's episode, and if you're interested in making your Sunday football watching experience a bit more entertaining by making a bit of money on these games, our season-long sponsor, MyBookie, is still offering all Film Room viewers a 100% deposit bonus on all initial deposits up to $1,000. That will double your bankroll, which means if you hit on whatever bets you place, you double your winnings. Or if you lose, it kind of mitigates how much you lose because it's all house money anyway. So really, no matter what the outcome is, it's a nice little bonus for you. And you don't even have to bet on just football either. You can bet on baseball, basketball, hockey, esports, politics, MMA. I mean, you name it, they got it. So it's a great site and a great partner for this channel. I've been on my bookie for three years now and I've, I've loved it. So again, if you're already planning on putting a few bucks down on these games anyway, you might as well do it at my bookie, collect that free bonus double your winnings, or at least make the losses hurt less, and uh, yeah, see how much you can win. As for me and the channel, I'll be back next Monday morning, potentially on Sunday night, depending on how fast I can get it out, uh, to talk about that Jets-Patriots game, and then not this weekend, but next weekend, if you guys are going to be at that uh, Bears-Chargers game in Chicago, I think I'm coming out to the Windy City for that one to uh, tailgate and catch my first Bears game at Soldier Field, if you can believe it, so... Let me know in the comments if you guys are going to be there, and uh, we'll meet up, we'll tailgate, have some beer, have some hot dogs, uh, kind of chill out, and then go, go watch the Bears beat the shit out of the Chargers. So, yeah, I'll be back in a few days with that Picks Analysis episode, and until then, later.